Welcome to another English language A-level video with me, Paul from the QE in Darlington. This one is another language diversity video. And in this one, we're going to be looking at language and age, specifically about teenage language. Let's start with some research findings that there are about teenage language. Uh, this is taken from the AQA textbook. There is a linguist stroke teacher called Gary Ives, who's done some recent research in West Yorkshire in a secondary school in Bradford and he interviewed 63 uh, teens of various ages and asked whether they thought people spoke differently according to their age and guess what 100% agreed so there is this widespread perception that you know your age really does matter as a sociolinguistic factor and there is also this perception that as you get older you get posher you tend to use more standard English you tend to swear less and when these uh, teenagers in Bradford were asked about, you know, what, what characterises their own teenage language, uh, they identified three main areas, informal register, taboo language, by swearing, and dialect forms. So the sorts of things that you've got there on the slide, those words and phrases. So that's research done by Gary Ives in Bradford quite recently. So we're thinking about language age, and there has been a lot of research done about this. Penelope Eckert came up, comes along in the late 1990s, and her initial argument is that actually discussion of age groups isn't necessarily straightforward, because she argues that there are different ways of defining age, because you have your chronological age, but you've also got your biological age and also your social age as well by which she means your chronological age is a conventional age, you know, how many years you've been on this planet, 13 years. Whereas your biological age might be about your physical and perhaps emotional and mental maturity. So you might be a 13 year old, but you might have the maturity of a 16 year old or the maturity of a 10 year old. And then thirdly, you've got your social age, which is kind of bound up with your social experiences. So, you know, what school that you go to, what life experiences that you've had, your relationship with your family. Age is a person's place at a given time in relation to the social order, she argues. A stage, a condition, a place in history. So don't think of age in just this straightforward chronological way, she argues. You've also got Jenny Cheshire, whose work we've come across in previous videos, who argues that actually adult language develops in response to important life events that affect the social relations and social attitudes of individuals. So, for example, think of you getting a job. So uh, getting married, having children, etc., etc. You know, adults language changes in the same way as children's language changes too. Um, and that's echoed by Douglas Bigham who in 2012 argues that actually important life events are more likely to occur post-18 at an age of emerging adulthood. Eckert, Cheshire and Bigham, a little bit of research there on language and age. We have some other research. This is Anita Britta Stenstrom, who's done a lot of recording of 13 to 19 year olds talking. And she's got a kind of checklist here of some of the key features that she's noticing in teenage speech. Let's have a look at them. First of all, you've got this notion of irregular turn taking and overlapping. So not necessarily tidy in terms of who is speaking in a conversation. And you might well have some interruptions that are going on. That could be interpreted as rudeness. It could be interpreted as enthusiasm. So beware of being too pejorative about things like overlapping. You've got indistinct articulation and word shortenings. And that's an interesting one. The idea of clipping or elision of words. People have complained about that for a long time. In our language change part of the course, we've got the Irish novelist, Jonathan Swift in 1712, who was so annoyed at the clipping that's going on by young aristocrats, where the, instead of saying the word reputation, they're saying the word wreck. He's so annoyed by it that he, he marches off to the Queen in, in order to try and get a royal academy that's going to police people's language. He's unsuccessful. So word shortenings by young people have been around for a long time. 
Then you've got the kind of competitive elements, I suppose, that you sometimes get in teenage talk of teasing, name calling and verbal dueling. You have slang, unsurprisingly. We have taboo language, unsurprisingly. And we have perhaps uh, a greater level of code switching language mixing. Certainly that was a big feature, wasn't it, in the Gary Ives research done in Bradford in those teenagers. OK, Stenstrom's features of teenage talk. We then have some other researchers, which are mentioned in the textbook as well. I'm looking at page 168. We have work done uh, in 2011 by Ignacio Palacios Martinez. She claimed that teenagers use negatives more frequently, much more frequently than adults do. And a third of these negatives, <coughs> excuse me, occurred in orders, suggestions, refusals. She's basically arguing that teenagers tend to be more direct when they speak. They're more likely to say things like, no way, no, no, nah, don't know, couldn't give a toss. Those kind of negative forms, whereas perhaps older people are perhaps a bit more attentive towards negative face. I, they don't want to threaten the other person's face, maybe because older people have spent longer time in occupations. You've also got Uni Berlin's research. Now, she has focused on tag questions. There's one area that's very fertile for linguistic research, and that's tag questions. There's all sorts of research that's been done on it over the years about language and power, about language and gender, about language and social class, and here about language and age, because Uni Berlin is arguing that teenagers use more tag questions than older generations. And she concluded that social class was actually a very important factor here, that when she listened to working class teenagers, they tended to use in it as an unchanging tag question, whereas yeah was being used by a middle class group. And also there was a bit of a difference between genders as well, that okay was used more by boys than girls. Another aspect of teenage language was focused on by Stenstrom, Anderson and Housend, and they looked exclusively at the language of 14 to 16 year olds in London, and they identified multiple negation, like I ain't done nothing, uh, the use of ain't instead of isn't, uh, ellipsis of auxiliary verbs, like going downtown, and non-standard pronouns, like me and him are going out, so they identified those as sort of key characteristics of 14 to 16 year old speech. But that was from 2002. So beware, you know, there's a warning on this that a lot of this research is, is getting on a bit now. OK, we have other research which is done a little bit more recently that's again mentioned in the textbook on page 169 by Christopher Odato. And he just looked at one particular word. He looked at that discourse marker, like, which is uh, sometimes a quite controversial word, isn't it? Because people often complain about other people's use of the word like. A data basically identified three stages in the use of like, that it wasn't just randomly used, that you could identify three stages. In the first stage, children were using this word like quite infrequently and only in a few syntactical positions. So usually at the beginnings of clauses, like you won easily, whereas the second stage, children are using like much more often and they're using it in a greater number of positions in the sentence. And interestingly, the girls tended to move to this stage uh, quicker than the boys, which is quite a common feature in language change and gender. But it tends to be that females who latch on to new forms much more quickly than males. And then finally, you've got the third stage where the children are now using it more frequently in all sorts of other positions, maybe in a more kind of subtle way. So they can be using it, for example, before a prepositional phrase. Look at how yours landed, like right on the target. And like I've just said, it tends to be the girls who move to this stage at an earlier age than boys. So all of this shows that, you know, the use of that word like isn't random, that there is kind of some kind of systematic innate order going on in its usage. 
So Zimmerman concludes that there are certain factors that are really influential in teenage language. You've got the media, uh, you've got new means of communication, which presumably means the, the use of various apps on people's mobile phones. Uh, you've got music, you've got street art, you've got graffiti. And Vivian Clark comes to these conclusions that basically young people have this freedom to challenge linguistic norms. They're seek seeking to identify themselves as different. They're trying to establish new identities and they need to be seen to be sort of modern and cool and up to date and fashionable and all of those things. OK. So it's interesting now to look at uh, media representations about young people's language. And I suppose the point that we ought to make is when we're talking about, say, teenage language, that's a big old age group, isn't it? Because if you imagine the difference between a 13 year old language and a 19 year old language, that is a big difference. OK, can you reasonably compare a 13 year old girl going to state school? to a 19 year old boy who's attending Oxford University. You know, is it sensible to lump those two people together and look for their characteristic language? But when we open our newspapers, we often see quite uh, interesting claims made about so-called teenage language. So let's think about, this is a kind of like discourses analysis that we're doing here. So I'm gonna give you six headlines, which I've actually just taken from the textbook page 171, and let's just think about how language is used in order to try and influence the implied reader, try to shape the response with these newspaper headlines. From the Daily Telegraph, text speak, language evolution or just laziness? Next one, The Sun, illiterate blast at text message kids. The Daily Mail, Twitter, it's majorly bad. Leading headmaster condemns text speak for eroding school children's language skills. From the TES, which means the Times Educational Supplement website, text speak translates to great language learning. Creative approach opens up children's mind, expert says. Texting can boost children's spelling and grammar. That's from the BBC website. And then finally, from the Daily Mail, OMG, texts make you good at writing. Seriously? How text speak can help pupils write essays. So you can see here, you've got quite a mix here, haven't you? Quite positive and negative representations about teenage language, technology. Um, let's have a look at them one by one then. Let's go back to the first one. So this is from the Daily Telegraph. So the Daily Telegraph is a, a right wing conservative sporting uh, broadsheet newspaper. So it's typically its reader is somebody a bit older. Text speak, language evolution or just laziness. Now, so quite typically it's giving you a set of binary opposites, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's saying, you know, this technological language, it's either one thing or another. So that's fairly typical, a kind of reductive look at how a language operates. Notice how we've got this word text speak, which is a kind of neologism. A neologism is a newly constructed word. Here it's a hyphenated neologism where two words have been stuck together. OK, and I suppose it's not a bad word because what it demonstrates is that when people are texting, it's blended mode it's mixed mode although they're typing actually there are a lot of conversational talk like features that are going on there okay so here we're given a choice okay either it's language evolution which presumably we think of as being a good thing because evolution gives us good things doesn't it or maybe it's just laziness and laziness fits in with a set of metaphors that were put forward by a linguist called Jean Aitchison who is describing people's anxieties about other people's language. So uh, she likened it to a damp spoon syndrome. So it's the idea that when somebody puts a wet spoon into the sugar bowl, how revolting it is. It's just laziness and it spoils it for everybody else. It's laziness. So that links in with Gene Aitchison's metaphor 
about people's anxiety, about other people's laziness. The second one is from the sun. So it's characteristically, it's got these onomatopoeic monosyllabic words like blast and kids because it's trying to grab the attention of somebody who maybe has just got a passing interest or is not going to be spending hours and hours reading the newspaper. Okay, notice how uh, it's children who are identified as text message kids, almost as if the rest of the population doesn't use text messages. And we've got this word illiterate, this adjective illiterate in single inverted commas, which is presumably a criticism that's being made at children for their use of text messages. Okay, so it's quite kind of combative, isn't it? And the third one, this is again from the Daily Mail. So this is a, uh, a tabloid newspaper, it's a blue top tabloid newspaper. Twitter, it's majorly bad. Leading headmaster condemns text speak for eroding school children's language skills. Okay, so this is a, a kind of prescriptive viewpoint that is presenting uh, teenage language and technology in quite a negative way. We've got the mirroring of that form of language here with the use of elision, so the uh, disappearance of the vowel sounds in Twitter. And then you've got the mimicking of the kind of language that perhaps they think that young people are using with the use of that adverb majorly in there. We have the reference to a headmaster. He's not only a headmaster, but he's a leading headmaster as well. So here's somebody who is given kind of status and uh, very much influential and instrumental power. You're thinking you're not going to argue with a headmaster. And also you've got quite a strong mental verb that's used here, condemn. It's not just criticised, but condemn. So it's quite an extremely prescriptive viewpoint that is being represented that's coming through. And this word eroding is quite interesting as well. Again, this could link in with one of Gene Aitchison's metaphors in which she's arguing that some people think of language being like a crumbling castle. So that process of erosion that happens to castles is something that perhaps is happening to young people's language. So there's a lot of anxiety out there about the language uh, of young people and how it's been shaped by technology. On the other hand, we have the TES website here. Tra text speak translates to great language learning. Creative approach opens up children's minds, expert says. OK, so this is the complete antithesis to the previous one, because it's arguing that actually using your mobile phone and text messaging is very good in terms of your language development. It, like the previous one, it mimics some of the so-called texting features. So here it's using a number homophone on great. And again, like uh, the second one, it's using uh, inverted commas in order to show that this is a quotation from an expert. So it's not the viewpoint of the TES, but they have quoted from somebody who knows what they're talking about. OK, and so the argument here seems to be that it's not just that it's not destructive towards children's language, but that it is a po positive benefit, that it opens up children's minds. We've also got the BBC website. And the BBC, of course, is uh, paid to be impartial, so it can't necessarily be too biased or subjective in its viewpoint. And here it's quoting supposedly another expert that says texting can boost children's spelling and grammar. So it's not arguing that it does it all the time, but it uses an epistemic modal auxiliary to, in order to show that this can happen in certain circumstances. And we have another one from the Daily Mail that says, OMG, texts make you good at writing. So it's similar sorts of language devices that we used on that third one there, where it's mimicking some of these so-called text message features. How text speak can help pupils write essays. So this is another one that's showing some of the positive benefits about text speak. OK, so there are some interesting arguments in here. We have in the textbook on page 171, an explanation of the work done by Claire Wood, who's professor of psychology and education at Coventry University, who's basically arguing that when children are playing with these creative representations of language, i.e. they're doing text speak, um, they're rehearsing their understanding of letter sound correspondences 
a skill which is taught formally as phonics in primary classrooms. So texting can offer children the chance to practice their understanding of how sounds and print relate to each other. So she seems to be arguing that actually it's a good thing. There is also an explanation about the, this is related to the final headline there. This is the Department of Education study. And they concluded that they found no evidence that a child's development in written language was disrupted by using text abbreviations. OK, so you've got quite a lot of quite confusing, contradictory claims that are being made here about the, the influence of technology on young people's language. Let's have a look at a little bit of young people's language. Now, this is pre-teen language that we're going to have a look at. And again, this is taken from the textbook on page 172. And this is from a group of eight to 11 year olds. And this is their use of language on Instagram. And I'm interested to see what you think about the interchange that's going on here. So have a close read of the dialogue that we've got there. Maybe pause the video and then do this task. So what are some of the significant language features that you're noticing here? What are you finding in Lexis? What are you finding about semantics, like the word meanings? What are you finding about pragmatics? And what's going on in the grammar? So do some really nice annotation of some of those significant language features. And then think why. So what are some of the sociolinguistic and contextual influences on this kind of language? I'll just, let's just talk about the first three lines together. OK, so we've got Megan Ann saying me name means strong and capable. So what you've got here is a lot of non-standard spelling. And if this has been done deliberately, then we can call this I dialect. So presumably this I dialect has been used in order to try and convey some of the uh, prosodic features and the accent features of these young people. It's been deliberately done, consciously done in order to give character and personality and perhaps humour to that language. And that's very important because this kind of interaction that we've got here, it's not transactional. So it's not just conveying pieces of information, but it's about establishing and maintaining relationships. OK, so it's an interactional text. So that's why you get such a high degree of non-standard forms. You've got me as an alternative for my, and you've got the elision of the connect the coordinating connective and which is just an n okay now we said before on from stenstrom's uh research that clipping is a big feature of young people's language and we've certainly got it here deaf defo true short for definitely so notice the use of these kind of diminutive forms diminutive forms is where you put a vowel sound you shorten the word and you put a vowel sound on the end so instead of barbecue you might say barbie that's a diminutive form so here we've got some clipping that's going on here the x's here are presumably a replacement for paralinguistic features i body language we've got jess saying how you get that so you that is a letter homophone so how you get that it's non-standard there's no capitalization for the beginning of the sentence and there's no question mark either and again, you've got the X's there in order to show paralinguistic features. OK, so a lot of this is about, as I said, establishing and maintaining relationships. And it may well be that they feel that they're getting covert prestige, a kind of hidden status from using these kind of slang forms and non-standard features. OK, covert prestige. I will leave you to deconstruct the rest of that. I think the main point to make on this is that teenagers are very unlikely to be using this form of language now. That the kind of text message language that perhaps teenagers used 20 years ago that was characteristic of, of text messaging has now shunted down in generations and it's really only pre-teens who would do that. Um, maybe it's to do with technology, of course. Maybe with uh, predicted texts, it makes it unnecessary and a bit silly to be using these forms of language. I bet that many of you as 16, 17, 18 year olds 
wouldn't use language anything like this. Okay, let's finish with uh, an article then that is printed in the textbook and it has one of these highly emotive headlines. The teens who can barely talk. They only have an 800 word vocabulary. So you've got a very extreme, provocative uh, headline that's being used here. Uh, remember what I said before that often in media representations, teenagers are kind of lumped together as if they're one distinctive group. So beware of simply talking about teens as having a particular kind of language. The teens who can barely talk, they only have an 800 word vocabulary. OK, what you've got here and you get this in a lot of headlines is a level of certainty that they're trying to communicate. They only have an 800 word vocabulary. It does make you scratch your head and wonder, well, how did they got that statistic from? And how many teenagers do you know that only have a vocabulary of 800 words? Teenagers have been warned they are becoming unemployable because they use a vocabulary of just 800 words. The limited linguistic range also consists of many made up words and team speak, which is developed through modern communication methods such as text messaging and social networking sites. Today, Jean Gross, who advises the government on children's speech, said urgent action was required to prevent children failing to find jobs because they are unable to communicate. Mrs. Gross, who last week issued a start warning over the effect of television on children's development, said yesterday, teenagers are spending more time communicating through electronic media and text messaging, which is short and brief. We need to help today's teenagers understand the difference between their text to speak and the formal language they need to succeed in life. 800 words will not get you a job. The majority of teenagers should have developed a broad vocabulary of 40,000 words by the time they reach 16. Linguists have found, however, that although they may understand thousands of words, many choose to limit themselves to a much smaller range in regular conversation and on a daily basis, which could use as few as 800 words. OK. So here we've got this government advisor. So again, this is somebody who's represented as having influential and instrumental power. OK, and they're arguing that urgent action is required. Uh, it doesn't actually state what action can be done, but urgent action is required. Notice the use of the passive voice there. It's not clear who's going to be doing that urgent action to prevent children failing to find jobs because they are unable to communicate. So it's the old argument that actually these ways that young people are using of communicating together are actually going to have a detrimental effect on them for their careers, in the, for their future careers. OK, um, and later on in the article, it quotes the Tesco chief inspector who argues that there are woefully low standards in schools. You do wonder what's that, what that is actually based upon, but according to his perception, the chief executive said that there are woefully low standards in schools that cause employers problems. And then you've got the Ofsted inspector, John Bald, who didn't have much hair, who says that there is an undoubtedly a culture among teenagers of deliberately stripping away excess verbiage and language. When kids are in social situations, the instinct is to simplify. It's part of a wider anti-school culture that exists among some children, which parents and children need to address. So there's a lot of anxiety that's being represented in this tabloid newspaper. And I think, you know, if you're sitting there reading that, you're going to be fearful. You're going to be fearful about teenagers' future as a result of their very limited vocabulary. And I think you have to sort of deconstruct uh, messages like this and sort of wonder, well, what is it based on? What actual studies are these people referring to? Or are these just individuals who are sounding off, who are doing quite a subjective kind of immediate reaction to, to what they're seeing? 
Okay, right, thank you very much. We've come to the end of our video about teenage language.